Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at an Obsession 12 and a half inch F5 Newtonian. What is it? Well, it's an astronomical telescope designed to look up at the night sky. Its design is one of a Newtonian reflector. True to its namesake, it has a mirror at the bottom which gathers light. And this mirror is curved. I'm really exaggerating the curve here, directs the light into the secondary mirror here, which is flat and angled at 45 degrees, and it angles the light into the eyepiece here, and the eyepiece is where you look. To change the magnification, you change the eyepieces. Now the base design is one called a Dobsonian mount, named after John Dobson, the astronomer on the west coast who popularized this design several years ago. And all it means is that the telescope moves very simply up and down and left and right. Now when these Dobsonian telescopes first became popular in the 1970s and 1980s, they had a reputation for being, you know, for cheapskates. They were for people who wanted the maximum amount of aperture for the least amount of money. Well, it took other manufacturers like Obsession here to upgrade all of the parts and they have created a new niche within our hobby, the premium Dobsonian. Obsession is a premium brand and it carries a premium price. This particular model, $4,495 for the base unit plus any upgrades or accessories that you want. Delivery runs from several months to over a year, depending on which model that you want. Many people are surprised to learn that some of these high-end telescope companies are really, really tiny. They're just a tiny flea compared to a giant like Mead or Celestron or Orion. Very often it's a family working in their barn or in their garage, turning out really beautiful handcrafted, high quality instruments and Obsession is definitely in that category. I think Obsession is a very good name for this company because its owners do tend to be very passionate about their telescopes. I know people who own two or even three of these things. Now this particular model, the 12 and a half inch, is the smallest in their line. The line includes the 12 and a half inch, the 15, the 18, the 20, and you may be able to talk them into making you a 25 inch. I know of at least a couple of 36 inch models that they made. One of them lives in northern New Hampshire up in the mountains and its owner has named it Godzilla. It weighs 270 pounds and you need a fairly tall stepladder to get to the top. If you know the owner and if you know where it lives, you can contact them and make an appointment to see Godzilla and look through it. Now as of filming today, Obsession is transitioning from this wooden, what they call the classic design, to their new UC, their ultra compact design, which has a lot more metal in it. One club member has at least one of these on order. When it comes in, I'll try to get a report on it for you. Okay, so why make a telescope that looks like this? Well, once you get to a level of about 10 to 12 inches or so, it starts to get unwieldy and cumbersome to make a solid tube. It gets to be a little bit hard to transport, and so they go to this truss tube type design where everything kind of collapses down. If you think about it, a telescope is mostly air. There's mostly nothing here. The whole purpose of the structure is to hold these two mirrors and the eyepiece steady so that you can look through it. Now again, these Obsession telescopes get very large. I had a 20 inch here for a while and people came from several states over to come look through it. What's the difference in light gathering ability? Well, I took this diagram right off of Obsession's webpage and it shows a typical eight inch telescope on M13, that's the globular cluster in Hercules, and it shows simulated views through all of their models. Now, the problem, if you will, from looking at this diagram is that when you see this, you're gonna want the biggest one, which I understand, just be careful. There is a price to be paid for that, both literally and figuratively. Okay, so what's better about this premium truss tube daub compared to, say, a conventional unit like my trusty Orion X-T8 here? By the way, if you haven't seen my other videos and others around the internet, this is the model that I recommend for beginners more than any of the others. For $400, you get a telescope that's complete and it will keep you busy for a long time and possibly even forever. So what is better about the truss tube design? Well, it, it's pretty much everything. So starting with the optics, the mirror is not a commercial mirror that's made in some factory. It is made by one person by hand. And in fact, when you order a telescope from Obsession, they don't actually make the mirrors. They subcontract that part out. And it's common to get the structure and the mirror arriving at separate times. 
large aperture mirror making is a bit of an art. There are very few people who are really good at this, and these people who they use for these mirrors are all masters at their craft. So very often you wind up waiting for your mirror, but it's worth it. But even more so than the mirrors, it's the mechanical motions of the telescope. This commercial daub, I mean, it's eight inches, it's not that big, so the motions are pretty good on this one, but you'll find it's usually a little stiffer on this axis than it is on this axis. On this one, even though it's a much larger, heavier telescope, it moves with just the touch of a finger. And there's a couple of reasons why this is so. So on the azimuth axis, that's the one that goes back and forth like this, it turns out that the two materials that they use to get the right amount of what they call stiction, that's the friction that sticks but is good for motioning a telescope, is Teflon pads on one side and countertop laminate on the other, yes. The Formica that's on your countertop turns out to be an excellent material for telescope making. You want to get some weird looks? Go to your local big box home improvement store and ask if they have some scrap pieces of laminate that they can sell you. Very often they're just going to be anxious to get rid of this stuff. And if they ask you, what do you want to do with this? Just tell them, yeah, I'm making a telescope. So on the rocker base here, you'll see that it's a pretty simple device. There's that countertop laminate on the bottom of the base, and then you can't see the Teflon pads, but they're on that triangular part there. On this one, there are pads at the bottom, and then there's nothing on the base material here. There's just rubbing against this, looks like a sort of a melamine veneer here. And I'll also clue you in on this. When you go in and look at it, which I encourage you to do if you get one of these things, very often you'll find those Teflon pads that they put on there aren't actually Teflon pads. Sometimes they're just white pieces of plastic. Not all of them do that, but some of them do that to cut costs. So now you have a case where neither one of those materials is correct. Now, if you have one of these things, you can actually go in and change that. In fact, this is probably the most common mod that I see done on a commercial daub is they go down there and they fix that azimuth axis by putting countertop laminate on one side and Teflon pads on the other. Okay, so that's the azimuth axis. That's the axis that moves the telescope left and right. What about the altitude, the one that makes it go up and down? Similar situation, countertop laminate on one side, Teflon pads on the other, but you'll notice a really big difference between the premium Dobsonian and the commercial grade one. The smoothness of the altitude axis depends on the diameter of the side bearings. The larger the diameter, the smoother the motions. And one philosophy says that the diameter of the side bearing should be at least the diameter of the mirror itself. So for example, if this is an eight inch telescope, you should in theory have a side bearing that is at least eight inches in diameter. And as you can see, it's nowhere near that. It's probably about four or five inches. This isn't a criticism of the X-T8 or any commercial Dobsonian. It's just a reality of what they have to sell this thing for. And really for the money, it's quite good. But look at the premium Dobsonian and look at the size of the side bearings here, this piece of metal here. It's a 12 inch mirror, but it has a side bearing diameter of 18 and a half inches. It's an example of conspicuous overkill, which you'll find in many aspects of the design of this telescope. And in fact, the side bearings are so wide, they chop off the top half, because if you think about it, you're never gonna use that part of it. So the final result is that both axes feel the same and have the correct amount of stiction, if you will, for tracking objects across the night sky. And the problem is that stars don't move either like this or like this around the sky. It's always a combination of the two axes. And if the stiction or the friction, if you will, is not the same on both axes, you're constantly having to compensate as you pull this thing to track the stars. On this one, I know you're at home and you can't feel this, but this thing just glides. Some people say it feels like almost a magic carpet as you're moving this thing. And when you get good at this, the telescope almost disappears from under your eye as you automatically sort of move the thing around and it just sort of vanishes and it's just you in the sky. So one additional feature is this mirror cell. And conventional wisdom shows that a mirror cell should clamp the mirror as tightly as possible because the alignment is so crucial for collimation. This mirror cell almost turns that thinking upside down. It's actually a sling and the mirror just rests on these pads behind here. The mirror is actually just hanging out in space and 
You wouldn't think this would work, but it works remarkably well. And I think one theory is with these larger mirrors, yeah, they're going to move around if you drive it around or you know, drive it over bumpy roads. But once it settles down, it's going to tend to settle down into about the same position. And collimation or alignment is usually just a minor touch-up when you set the telescope up. So this is lighter, it's simpler, and there's a lot of air around here so that the mirror cools off more quickly. Now keep in mind, these tend to be large telescopes with large mirrors and cool down is an issue. You'll see here there is a fan at the bottom. I've never actually used that. Another interesting feature is this secondary spider with the curved veins. This is a little bit different from the cross-shaped secondary spider that you may be used to seeing on a reflector. And the problem with those traditional crosses is they put these diffraction spikes around bright objects and it's constantly reminding you that you're looking through a reflector. So these curved secondary veins here actually disperse the light to the point where you don't see those spikes anymore. And by the way, if you're interested in making your own telescope, Dave Kriege, the owner of Obsession, wrote the book on this. This is the Dobsonian Telescope, a practical manual for building large aperture telescopes. And what I find interesting about this book is he pretty much reveals all of his secrets. He doesn't hold anything back. Uh, the book is almost 500 pages long. And if you're handy with woodworking or with uh, metalworking, this could be for you. You could actually build your own obsession. So this book does contain some fairly technical information, but Dave is a really good writer. And sometimes I'll just open the book up to a page or two and read a little bit. He can be very entertaining. So when I talk to people about these telescopes, the questions they have tend to fall into one of two categories. Number one, how hard is it to put together? And number two, how well does it hold its collimation, the alignment between its optics? Keep in mind, you're going to be assembling and disassembling this thing all the time. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is the telescope broken down into its constituent parts. Also, I have the shroud here. This normally goes over those truss poles. I had it taken off so that you could see inside of it. But one thing you notice right away is that despite the telescope size, this thing, thing can be stored almost anywhere. I know people who store these things in the back of a closet so it's out of the way. So I'll walk you through the parts that I think you should be paying a little bit more attention. It's really not hard. I mean, you've got the mirror base assembly here, you've got the upper truss, and then you have the truss poles over there. So the first thing to do is there are these split blocks here, and you take the poles and you put them into the blocks like this. And these are labeled, and one question for the collimation, by the way, uh, they're labeled left and right, and they're labeled in pairs, one through four. So when you put it together, try to put it together the same way every time. I don't always do that. I get a little bit lazy, but um, if you really want to be correct about this, that is what you do. So by the way, one other hint, when you're putting this together, there's a dust cover on the mirror box. It, leave that on. That's the last thing you take off. Don't assemble the thing with the dust cover off because you don't want to be dropping things onto the mirror. Okay, so now that you have this together, you'll notice there are two holes in the top of these truss poles here, and there's a bolt that sticks out, so it's pretty intuitive here. You're going to be threading that bolt into those two holes here. And again, if you're really concerned about putting it together the same way every time, make sure you always put either the left one in front or the right one in front. And again, sometimes I get lazy and don't do that, but uh, you can do what you want. Now, this point here, I would advise you that when you get to this stage, um, because this thing is just kind of hanging up here, uh, I would not stop at this point until you finish. Really, just stay here until you get all of this done because this thing's just kind of hanging up here and it's not really secured by anything right now. So they have four nuts here, and you don't tighten everything down fully the first time. You just sort of leave everything loose. So now that you have all four of these on the upper truss assembly, you can begin tightening all these, which I did these, but you can tighten all these down as well. And there you go, you have your completed telescope. You can reach in there and take the dust cover off, and you're ready to go. 
And here we are on a brisk New Hampshire January morning with the telescope in its natural habitat. You'll notice I do have the accessory wheelbarrow handles installed. You do want to use those if you have to move the telescope around. It only takes about a minute to install or deinstall them. I say that because at some point you're going to want to move the telescope maybe just a little bit and you're going to be tempted to pick the thing up and move it and you really don't want to do that because it's held together largely by gravity. You don't want gravity working the wrong way for you. Also, once you get the telescope in place, do remove the wheelbarrow handles. It only takes a minute or so. Don't leave them on. We've all done this in the past. If you leave them on, you are going to trip over them in the dark. So this particular telescope used to belong to me. I bought it off a club member several years ago. I kept it for a couple of years, and then in a moment of weakness, I sold it to another club member. Yeah, that wasn't the smartest thing I've ever done. I kind of missed this thing, but anyway, it went to the right place. The guy really enjoys this thing. He actually has an, another 18-inch obsession in his garage, and he refers to this one as Junior. Now, the previous owner of this telescope logged an observation of the Horsehead Nebula in Orion with this telescope. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I don't know if I would try to get that object with something this small, but he was able to do it with a 19 millimeter pan optic and an H beta filter. That filter is mandatory for this object. I have seen the horse head once in my lifetime in a 24 inch Dobsonian. I had to be taught how to see it and I'm not entirely sure that I did see it. And again, as these things aren't really built for a lot of technology, you don't see a lot of people doing astrophotography with these things. I could probably be done. You could put a tracking table on it or a go-to system, but I don't know very many people doing that. This is built as a pure visual experience. I do want to mention this. There is a, what they call a sky safari called Oz Sky in Australia. And this guy holds this every summertime. And I don't have any affiliation with these people, but I keep meaning to go down there. But you go into the outback of Australia for a week, and then you can just geek out on astronomy in some of the darkest skies in the entire world. But I do want to show you this picture of his. Uh, look at all those obsessions that he has. Can you imagine what it's like to look through telescopes of such large aperture at such a dark sky location? One of these days, I'm going to get down there, and I'm going to do that trip. So there you have it, an overview of the smallest obsession, the baby obsession, if you will. Not for everybody, perhaps. Um, I find that when I talk about these telescopes to some people, a lot of them are like, yeah, that's nice, but it's not for me. Uh, others, when you describe this to them, you see their faces light up and they're like, yeah, that's exactly what I've been looking for. So if that's you, go for it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.